You may have noticed there were some people standing up last time. Not, we can imagine they wanted to stretch their legs, but they probably wanted to sit down. So if you could scoot into the middle of your respective rows, um, that would be very helpful. Um, and there is also another announcement that there is a uh, single source recycling bin in the back, should you have a recyclable to dispose of. <laughs> and uh, we'll let you all finish murmuring and such. All right, um, well, I uh, would like to introduce the moderator for the next session, uh, which is the science and data collection session. Part of uh, being involved with the nonprofit is geared to my heart as the ecologist for the Watershed Association. Um, and Alex is the ecologist for the Jones River, so we work together quite a bit uh, on science and data collection. And he will introduce this panelist, so Alex. Great, thanks Sarah. Um, yeah, as Sarah said, I'm uh, Alex Mansfield. I'm the Ecology Program Director for Jones River Watershed Association in Kingston, the next watershed up. Um, I'm going to take a from the last session and thank everyone. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all the donors on here are, have been big donors to Jones River Watershed Association, uh, especially the Sheehan family and, and Island Foundation and DER, who also spent a lot of time uh, in the mud with us, too working on projects, so can't say enough good things about that. Um, and certainly I'll, I'll um, a big help to this conference. So in this session, um, we're going to talk about science and, and data collection. We're going to sort of run through the, the realm of different types of, um, of data collection. And I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, but I'm going to just give a, a quick introduction and thank you to them. Um, Karen Biela from uh, Dartmouth College is working on um, community-based volunteer monitoring programs. It's really a, a pleasure to have her here. Her, her project that she's been working on lately um, included looking at local watersheds down here and, and, and our volunteers, uh, our restore volunteers. So some of the stuff that she has to offer is, is very local and relevant. Um, Mike Trainer, uh, big thanks to Mike for stepping in at the last minute when Mike Benarski from BMF backed out um, for other commitments. So really appreciate Mike stepping in and uh, doing this at the last minute. And also, um, again, uh, DMF, another group that gets money with us in the, at the local level. Um, Mike helped us set up a video fish counting system in the Jones River two years ago that helped us uh, verify the success of the dam removal we had done and saw fish passing for the first time in <clears throat> at least 100 years at that site. So that was really exciting to do with Mike. And Bob Chen from UMass, um, who was on my graduate committee 20 years ago, <laughs> and uh, continues to do some of the coolest and, and most interesting science in Boston. So uh, I'm going to just leave it at that. I'm going to let them go through. They each have a few slides. So I'm going to pass you the slide advancer. And you can grab the microphone, Karen. And uh, we'll go on. And, and they'll each uh, do a little bit about the projects that they are working on. We have a few questions um, from me to them, and then we'll hopefully have time for all too. Hi, um, so I'm Karen Bielek, and um, I work at Dartmouth College as the uh, practice-based learning specialist. It's a new position. Um, so I'm working with faculty to help integrate community-based work into their courses. Um, and then I do my research as another component of that. Um, in terms of my background, uh, I was previously at the University of Maine, and that's where I uh, received my PhD in communication uh, and sustainability science. So I've done a, a wide variety of work um, on community university research partnerships, um, including things with stormwater, so I'm excited about the stormwater session, um, road salt management, um, and then recently fisheries, so it kind of runs the gamut here. Um, this recent work I'm doing in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Southern Maine. Um, Dr. Theo Willis um, is part of the project, as well as uh, graduate student Jason Smith. Um, and he's presenting up at uh, Southern Maine today, so he wasn't able to join us. Um, but the, the overarching goal for our project, and I'll just go here, um, uh, was to understand the role citizen science programs, volunteer monitoring programs, um, and the data generated from those programs play in river handling management. 
Um, simultaneously, Theo Willis is also looking at comparing um, the data that's generated from citizen science programs to video monitoring, so trying to get a sense of your know, uh, data quality. Some of the sub-goals, which is, I, I had to come down to the Cape for a couple of days this summer, it was just terrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of the sub-goals are to identify best management practices for running volunteer programs. Um, and my, we're primarily doing the interviews in Maine and, and Massachusetts. Um, identify ways that data is or is not being used in a variety of management settings. So currently Jason um, is interviewing uh, state managers to understand how they're using this uh, data that's generated from programs um, for management decisions, and then we'll also be looking at, at um, more regional management as well. And then we're exploring opportunities for improving data collection when necessary. So those are kind of the, the, the big goals of the project. And I did spend uh, quite a bit of time, so I came down to Mass, and then have been doing interviews in Maine. Um, and just for those who, who haven't seen River and Herring monitoring um, in action, this is just an example from um, the Classic Lake um, Dam in Maine. So volunteers sit and they count the fish as they come by. Some people I see had nods who have done this or are organizing these programs. Um, and you're counting how many fish come by a certain point to get a sense of you know, how many are making it to their spawning grounds. Um, and uh, they're also taking things like temperature and air temperature, water temperature, they're making observations about whether the kind of um, creatures are in the area for the day. Um, this is a, another example from down east Maine. Um, this was the day I was counting. Um, um, then this is the Centerville River in Mass. Uh, this is just, this is low water, so they're not fish passing at this time. Um, but this is one of their counting sites. And then uh, Dan Riscata River in Maine, if you ever have a chance to um, go to this site, it's just this amazing fish way that they've invested. And we talk about fundraising, um, a lot of investment in this project. They do hire someone to do their counting, but it's just a beautiful site, so I thought I'd put that up there. And they're passing millions of herring every um, spring, so it's pretty neat. Um, so that's the overview of the project. Great, thanks, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Trainer with the Division of Marine Fisheries. And um, I have a Bachelor's of Science degree from Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. Um, had that for, or I graduated in 2008, and have since been um, kind of experimenting with what I want to do when I grow up. Uh, I was a, an observer in Alaska for a little while, worked with State of Connecticut, uh, before the state of Massachusetts, I've done some aquarium work, tried to get oyster farming. Um, so, you know, all, all sorts of fun things going on. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead here to give you guys an idea. Uh, so, in the last five years or so with DMF, I've been um, kind of a jack of all trades, do some commercial sampling, some survey sampling, grant funded stuff, um, work with river herring, uh, mostly lobster. Uh, crab sampling, horseshoe crab sampling, so uh, you know all sorts of stuff. Um, this is the general idea of a video monitoring system. Um, this one is in the Namaskit River in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and the general idea is this is situated at the top of the fish ladder. So as fish come up, um, I, I realize it doesn't look as pretty as it could, but um, fish come up and basically are guided through this channel, uh, which is. Uh, so there's a camera within this, this aluminum box, and fish are basically you know, forced by the camera. And that generates um, basically video footage of, of fish coming through whenever, whenever you're looking at trying to, to monitor fish during a certain time. And um, so in, in this photo here, where the, the aluminum box kind of reduces in size to, to the left, the camera's in there and it's separated from the channel using a piece of Lexan or plexiglass. And um, I guess I should explain the, the wooden structures here. Uh, one of the issues with doing something with video monitoring is environmental conditions that, that can affect your, your video feed or your, your, um, your recording. So these are essentially uh, a quick idea that we came up for reducing the glare that's getting within, within the aluminum box. And the sun doesn't, apparently doesn't need to be shining directly in. Um, I think the water refracts it and bounces it all over the aluminum and, and that can cause some problems. So 
troubleshooting is, is big in this um, and with this project, um, but fortunately it, it's useful in many ways, and the um, the advantages definitely outweigh the disadvantages. So we we have these in several rivers, uh, four in some southeastern Mass and a couple up north, and um, they've they've proven to be very useful with with what we're looking for, not only with river herring but also with other species that that may be coming coming through the ladder. So. Um, that's pretty much just on the video monitoring, and I'm sure we'll dive into it a little bit more as we move on. I'll just add one thing to what Mike's saying. He's really downplaying how difficult it is to install and maintain these things. Um, this is like 24-7 all the time, making sure there's not stuff trapped in there, and it's falling down, and high flows and low flows, and all of the stuff we talked about, about refraction, refraction of light. Um, it's not... Uh, Mike's making it sound real simple because he does it a lot, but it's really challenging. Uh, so I'm going to mix it up and stand up. Um, so um, my name is Bob Chen. I'm a professor at UMass Boston, and I've been there 24 years. Um, trained as a blue water chemical oceanographer and have been just sort of climbing up into the watershed ever since. Um, <laughs> it's an um, so I want to just give you some quick examples about some of the things that we can do with environmental sensors. Uh, we're in a unique time. There's these technological developments where we're getting remote sensing pictures of a whole big area down to about two meter resolution. So we can really get very detailed looks uh, at, the, at the surface. Um, we have three dimensional models in water bodies and we have two dimensional, three dimensional models of watersheds. So we can begin to make predictions about what's gonna happen uh, in the future. But all of this depends on sensing and measurements on the ground, either by volunteers, by discrete sampling, or by uh, sensor systems. Um, so here's an example of remote sensing in Boston Harbor, a project we're looking at Landsat at 30 meter resolution. Of course, we have to ground treat that with, with ships and, and buoys and whatnot. Um, here's an example of a, a, a Boston Harbor model that runs in 3D, three days predictive, uh, running at about 30 meter resolution. Uh, and we can get that down to about 10 meters and then a deposit uh, estuary. Um, <clears throat> some of our sensors are moving. So this is a towed vehicle, a tow fish that we tow you and goes up and down in the water column. Got a whole number of sensors packed underneath this little ray here. Um, and so every one of these little points here is a data point. So we can go up and down and put this whole contour of a cross section of what's going on in the Ponce and Estuary in about a 45 minute span. So tidally it shifts. You can watch things go in and out. Uh, and realize that this whole thing is a two meter depth. Okay, so it's, it's, it's interesting. But if we can see it with sensors, the fish can see it with their own chemical sensors. Um, and if, if we take just a grab sample here and a grab sample here and one in the morning and one in the afternoon and one per month, we're missing a lot of the dynamics of things that are going on affecting the uh, organisms that live in it. Um, this is a little truck tracker. Um, I think people know where trucks are. We put in a waterproof box with it float around in the ocean and it drifts around like this. And so we can see where the water bodies move and what the fate of contaminants or organisms or whatever else uh, that's drifting plankton uh, can happen uh, somewhere. Um, these buoys we've made and put into Boston Harbor, uh, and they can give you this long tidal signal uh, wherever, wherever you are, but also we can see the influence of Hurricane Katrina or, or something else as they hit. Um, we can also look at the seasonal pulses, the fall of dump when all the leaves put organic matter into the system, and it comes, and now, right now, a big snow melt, all the road stuff is coming out uh, into the, the system, and we can see that because these things are long-term looking. We don't have to send people out in bad weather to, to sort of uh, figure out what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> ben Weatherill is a student uh, that's graduated with me, and he's been working on bacterial predictions. So we have environmental monitoring buoys and sensors, um, <clears throat> and he can then take that and say, in the Charles River and the Boston Beach, here's the predicted water quality for tomorrow uh, in terms of bacteria above or below, green flag, red flag, whatever you have. So we can put that on, on the web, for example. Uh, <clears throat> some really simple things, like can we get a video camera, $500 or less, but we mount it with a solar panel so that it's autonomous, and we use cell phone technology to get the data back every 15 minutes, and we can take a look at bluff erosion on the Boston Harbor Islands, for example, the influence of storms, uh, the influence of freeze-thaw cycles, things that haven't been observed without these sensors. Um, we can take a look at um, 10 o'clock and 11.15 at a salt marsh and watch the water come in and go out and see who's there and who's not there. We can, we can listen to what's there. We can see a beach um, at low tide and high tide during the winter, during storm, and figure out those different conditions and what's been affecting those things that are often not observed. Um, <clears throat> we can measure water level and integrate that into existing systems that say, here's the tides, 
with the storm surge, and here's the predicted tides, and this is how accurate it is. Um, that's in Situate Harbor. Um, and I want to end it with this, is that um, I had a watershed education project uh, in uh, Milton where the students in seventh grade said, I really don't want to go out to the pond every month. That's a 10 minute walk, it's really far, a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> to see like the outdoors, why do I want to do that? But can I just get a sensor system to do that for me? I can sit on my cell phone and, and look at the data. So um, Francesco Perry, uh, an engineer at UMass Boston said, well, let me design a, oh, they, and they wanted to look like a duck. <laughs> they said, oh, we, we can do this, but we can't do it like a duck. It's got to be a swan to fit all the sensors in it. And so we drew this at one of my boring talks uh, on a napkin, uh, and then we made it. And this is really interesting. So it had two, it has a bunch of sensors, but one is temperature at the very surface, and one is temperature at one meter depth. So the temperature at the surface goes up and down every day, and it's warmer than the temperature below, right, which is more consistent. There's some seasonal and weather patterns in there, right? But then down here, they reverse. Why? Maximum density of water is four degrees, fresh water, and this lake overturned in December, and we saw that the surface was colder uh, than the four degree bottom, deeper water. So there's some educational things that we can learn as well. Okay, so that's the introduction stuff. <laughs> That, that's great. The, 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 thanks for all of that, because that's exactly what I wanted to try to get to in this panel is everything from you know, people sitting beside the river, um, counting with a, with a hand counter and writing notes in a logbook, to uh, this really cool sensor technology that's being developed and how to integrate those. And so I think my, my first question was for Karen. Um, one of the things that, that we find, and I'd be interested to hear what you say about it from your study, is that um, the volunteer community-based monitoring programs that we do in our watersheds generate a lot of really valuable data. We use that for fisheries populations and, and, and water quality. Um, but there's also a huge component of advocacy and stewardship and community involvement that comes from a volunteer program. And I wonder what if you could speak to that a little bit and also if you think that these new technologies that are becoming affordable and accessible um, if they, have, if they have a negative impact on that community aspect, or if there is a way to integrate those. So that was one of the things that we um, saw coming out of our interviews with the River Herring, uh, the volunteer coordinators, as well as some of our observations and um, surveys of citizen scientists. I should have mentioned that we also sent out a, a survey to um, volunteers through the coordinators um, to get a sense of what are citizen scientists' experiences? What do they value? What might discourage them for, for, from participating? Why are they participating? Um, and we, we got 176 responses, which we were very pleased with, especially since we didn't actually have any direct contact with the citizens. So any volunteer coordinators in here whom, whom I talked with, I, I really appreciate you sending that survey out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Um, so in terms of, of uh, the influence of technology, I, a few things emerged from the interviews. Um, the first is I, I definitely think it should be a consideration. So um, in terms of will implementing or including a video monitoring program take away from the volunteers' experience? So I'd say some people want it. Um, some people feel like, for example, they're not capturing the night runs. So they're counting between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and they're saying, we're missing all the herring that are coming between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. But of course, there, there are concerns in terms of volunteer safety if you're having volunteers come out at night. So some people want that type of equipment to complement their ongoing efforts and to make sure that they're capturing accurate data. Other places, there are several places in uh, Maine, for example, they really struggle to get volunteers to cover the slots. So they've got you know, maybe seven volunteers. They've got all of these, these count slots that they, that they need to fill. Um, and so they're interested in that kind of equipment to, again, complement their missing data slots um, because they're concerned about the data quality. Um, so I would say in a couple of those situations, it, it might be beneficial. The things that came out of the survey that we learned are that volunteers care very much about the data. So um, their number one reason for, for wanting to participate is that they're concerned about the health of lo the local ecosystem. They want to learn more about river herring management. Um, but then another reason, one of the, the fourth reason is to get outside. They want to be outside. Um, and one of the things that would discourage them from participating is if they didn't see river herring. Um, and if they didn't learn about the results of their findings. 
So I would say it just needs to be balanced. So you, people want to know they're involved in something that's meaningful, which means they might want better data, so they want the counting equipment, but they also want to be, they also don't want to just be out there counting for no good reason. Um, so if you use it as a complementary device or as a way to double check your data, or um, then I think that that's, that could be beneficial, but I would definitely make sure that it doesn't take away from actual meaningful experience for the volunteers and that you're communicating that data um, to them uh, at the end of the day uh, so that they know what they're doing is helpful. Great, thanks, that's, that's really helpful. And a, a follow-up for, for both Mike and Bob or, or either, if you don't have an answer for it, but um, are the are the projects you're working on, the video fish counting, or the other other stuff you're doing, Mike, or Bob, all these sensors that you talked about, is there um, opportunities for community involvement in those sensors? Are they accessible to people, affordable? Is there a way that volunteers can play a role in those? Um, so for the video monitoring systems, it's it's a great tool because essentially you have a record of, of while you're recording anyway, anything that passes in front of the camera. So unlike an automated fish counter, um, you don't necessarily know if it's, say, an life that passes through the counter. Fortunately for automated fish counters, uh, which basically just consist of a piece of PVC with uh, an electric field generated within it, and once that field is broken, it, re it records uh, a count for a fish. Um, a lot of those systems are used on, uh, like, herring-only runs, where you're not going to get many other fish. The good thing with video monitoring systems is that you are recording any other fish that are coming through, or turtles, what have you. We've had all sorts of things, otters and stuff like that, um, which which can be very exciting to say volunteer. Unfortunately, to um, to what Karen said, a lot of the volunteer work for video systems isn't isn't getting outside and, and fresh air. It's um, and we haven't even experimented this with this yet, but um, I can see with technology now sharing video files either through Google Docs or Dropbox. Um, so, you know, these files can be easily accessible to other people. They just may not be the most exciting work or you're not getting the fresh air that, that you can get doing a 10 minute herring count. Um, but, you know, there are always volunteer opportunities from, from the initial setup, which, which can be some grueling work. And there aren't too many volunteers who want to don waders and, and hop in a high flow river you know, in early March or what have you. So um, it, it gets tough to the point of environmental conditions can, can be harsh and um, troubleshooting a lot of times you, you're doing on the spot troubleshooting which you can't really rely on a volunteer, an untrained volunteer to do. So that's something that someone who's familiar with the system has to do. Um, so I would say volunteer work with the video monitoring systems would just consist of reviewing footage, doing similar to 10 minute volunteer counts. Um, you know, viewing certain sections of footage uh, and basically just noting the amount of herring that comes through. And if you don't like to go outside, you don't have to. So <laughs> there's that. You can play on the phones like like pop students. Do. So yeah, I, I agree with both um, uh, Kieran and, and, and Mike here that it's really an integrated approach. You need you need to have people eyes in the field so that you can know where to put the sensors and how to interpret the sensors and 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 ground truth the sensors and take discrete samples to, to make sure it's all calibrated and working well. Um, ownership is really incredibly important. I own this site, this is my site, I own and am responsible for the data. So even if they're not going out every day and, and, and using their eyes, they're looking at the data and paying attention to the data every day and if something goes wrong, we gotta fix the sensor or, or clean the sensor or, or do whatever. So um, that, and then I, I just wanted to say that this thing is an incredibly powerful sensor that volunteers all own, okay? So it has GPS, it has phone, it has audio, it has um, Google Maps, it has, and then we can outfit it with a temperature probe, you know, very simple, cheap kind of things. So um, citizen science really, and sensors are, are coming together in that we can, if we deploy, I always deploy things, deploy a thousand volunteers, uh, that's a lot of eyes and, and data coming in, um, you know, through a, a, a built-in telemetry system. Um, so it doesn't have to come out of an engineering sort of solution. It's already been engineered, we can use the, the citizen sciences to get data. Sure. Um, it, it, I think the thinking about the use of cell phones for this kind of work would be really interesting to think, especially in terms of capturing data. So a lot of so the volunteers are, are often writing their data on a sheet, and then the coordinators are entering that data. Sometimes they'll have the volunteers enter it on their own, etc. But 
Yeah. There are so, multiple things you could do with that. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a friend that, it, the program doesn't exist anymore, but it should. It's called Dandelion Watch. And so you just take, um, you just watch when the first dandelion pops up in your backyard, and then you look at when it turns yellow, the flower, and then you see when it gets the puffball, and you have a little GPS on your phone, and you enter it into a system. And you do this nationwide. And you do this for 10 years, and you can see the, the, the onset of earlier spring, which is an indication of climate change. So just phenology if you do citizen science, but you get different regions happening at different rates. So this is a friend of mine, Rob Stevenson, who did this, but um, there's a whole host of things you can do with citizen scientists and sensors. Yeah, absolutely. And there is a video account on Quasa uh, late in May, and they actually have the video posted online. And then they're they're asking volunteers to, to count. So there are some of those technologies out there. I don't know how much engagement they have with it, but I think there's some things. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we've considered taking our feed to YouTube so people can watch it, sort of outsource it to anybody. Yeah. Um, great. That's a great helpful thing. Um, this is a this is a question for Bob. Um, one of the things about most of the many of the monitoring programs we do, they're they're intended to answer a question for about water quality for EPA or they're intended to um, address a, you know like the fish counting system it's a DMF method and so there there needs to be an approval process for the method and that needs to be established and sort of verified um, what do you think that what's the timeline for some of these new technologies taking them from the development stage to the applicable stage. So, so it completely depends on what you're measuring or what your sensors are. So for example, if you had just weather, uh, it's a weather, bird, weather bug sensor system, everyone knows relative humidity and temperature. Those are standard sort of measurements, water temperature. Um, dissolved oxygen becomes a little trickier. You've got to calibrate. And so that might take some proof that you're calibrating before people believe you, but it's a standard measurement. And then there's other things like CDOM or bacterial predictions, which might be a decade get approval by EPA or something like that. Um, so then it becomes a user-driven kind of a thing. Is it useful to the, the stakeholder as is, without the approval, and how much more useful will it be with the approval, so how much effort should we put into the approval process? So uh, it really just depends on which, which, what you're measuring and, and how you're measuring it and, and who you are with what you know, stamp of approval. But, so it's hard to answer that. Some things are ready to go, uh, and some things are, are, are a decade away. I kind of follow up for you, Mike. Um, the on the video counting systems, you you mentioned using the video data the same way the volunteer count works, which is watching it and using it for ten minutes. And I know that would be an approved process because it fits the DMF method. But I know we have also played with um, motion detection software and things like that. Do you know anything, or can you speak at all about <clears throat> using um, software tools like that and how they would fit into say DMF um, accepting the data from multiple systems? Um, so with video monitoring, obviously you need to capture the video, otherwise it's useless. And when we started, we were essentially recording 24 hours a day of footage for you know, several weeks, months, whatever, during the run. And we realized that that's just too time, time um, restrictive. We, we don't have the resources to do that. Um, so then we eventually started watching from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And that was an effect of the night footage not being up to par with being able to ID fish or, or even, you know, sometimes you get a full wave of fish and there's no way you can count however many come through. Um, so that's where video monitoring systems has its disadvantage um, and it kind of relates to volunteer counts not occurring at night because of, um, you know, dangers or what have you. But um, still watching 12 hours of footage a day even at four times speed is, you know, it, it can take time. So. We started experimenting around. There's some software out there, one notably is SalmonSoft, which has been used in fisheries for many years, uh, which essentially just records motion detection in video monitoring and will spit out a clip of that, of that fish passing through, of that fish. And um, SalmonSoft, unfortunately, comes with a pretty hefty price tag that many, um, many projects don't have the funding for, uh, for additional software like that when, when a lot of it when basically you're originally relying on labor-intensive um, viewing by either volunteers or we haven't worked with volunteers yet, but most of it is um, biologists with DMF. So we experimented with um, free free software called iSpy, which is motion detection software, which I believe was originally um, constructed to for ghost hunting. I'm not sure exactly how that works. <laughs> um, so I don't know how you have 
us. Uh, we'll set off a motion detection. But uh, it works. It works great with fish. Uh, we found out because fish are visible, and uh, for for many of our systems, we're only getting one or two fish coming through at a time, which which is great because then it'll spit out a, a clip. It it saves two or three seconds before the event, so you'll get two or three seconds before the fish comes through, and then one or two seconds after, and you have each event recorded, which is great because every little thumbnail, you, you know there's a fish in that thumbnail, and you can watch it, and you can record the time that the fish comes through, um, which isn't advantageous to us because, like I said, we don't have the resources to watch 12 hours before you never mind the 24, and um, this is much easier. You spit it, you know, you're, you're given a handful of clips, up to many hundreds of clips sometimes, but that's definitely better than watching watching any downtime uh, between any fish passage events. Thanks, Mike. I, I have a few more pre-planned questions, but I want to make sure we have time for the audience, so I'm going to skip to audience questions if anybody has any. If not, we'll jump back to these. Anybody? Yes, sir. I think my question is from Mike. Uh, identification of what's going by a counter, uh, what can you identify? Uh, so if you have it's rare, uh, a nice cloudy day with um, no sun glare coming through. Um, um, back <laughs> after you or before you? Okay. So I have a slide here that should, I don't know if you can see this that well, um, but these are four different species of fish, um, which the lighting is not the best. Um, and within each, each clip here, you can see a ring of lights. That's just the reflection of our LEDs from the camera. The first one, which is a little off screen, is a, is a river herring, which is what we were focused on. Um, and we actually ended up trapping behind this video camera just to make sure that there are all alewives as opposed to some bluebacks getting in there. So we, we guarantee that they're all alewives coming through. The second is a, a white sucker, and you can tell the difference between them just based on body size, things like that, um, thin shape. The, the alewife has a nice forked tail, which is very helpful in identifying that, that species, and they've also they also put on a pretty good glare when they pass through. The third is a white perch, which you know. So basically, we're using characteristics of each species to identify them. White perch have a deeper body, a little more stout than some of the other fish, and then finally here we have a yellow perch, which is quite obvious, and their um their yellow and black stripes stand out quite well. So with, with decent conditions, and I would say 80 or 90 percent of the time, we can identify the fish to the, you know, to the genus, if not the species, which was very helpful. And um, this is in the Mill River in Taunton, Massachusetts, and we had, I believe, upwards of 10 species pass through, and we were able to identify all of them, at least to the family, if not genus and species. And, and some of them, like some fish, we, we weren't comfortable ide identifying them to. Uh, like a bluegill versus a red breast sunfish, so we um, we would just kind of characterize those as sunfish, and um, luckily things like that aren't that important to us in terms of data collection. So hopefully that answers your question. Great. Any other on it? Yep. So my question is for your parents, and it's about volunteer retention. So um, you said actually seeing fish and then uh, hearing about the data at the end is important to people. Did anything else come up in the survey for why people would come back the next year? Um, why they wouldn't come back would be the count results, not, they're not shared at the end of the season, or they're, and they're not shared during the, during the season, so that was another one. Some volunteer coordinators um, are, you know, send out, we saw the first fish, or, you know, so they're, they're continuously updating their volunteers. Um, their preferred count slots aren't available, and I think that's just a time thing, you know, they, they uh, you can't get the slot that you're able to count at. And then the final one was do not see fish. So those were the top four that came out. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience? Yeah, sure. Any, any other questions in the audience here? Up yeah. front? Can we borrow the masses uh, temperature sensors that float around <laughs> in the water so we can figure out? Um, so so it, 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 it depends. You know, we're, we're interested in doing studies wherever for some things. I got and other things are, are cheap. <laughs> 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 So we'll talk at the break. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will say that one of the uh, cameras that Bob showed on the salt marshes that we have a couple going in the Jones River, thanks to help of the NYC video. Any other questions in the audience for the panelists? 
Samantha? So I'm interested too in how we can maybe partner with universities and Division of Marine Fisheries to be able to expand the use of some of these technologies. I think we've done, at least in our watershed, a lot of volunteer monitoring and need to expand um, our range and ability to get more data. And so it's kind of a generic question, like how do we build a partnership between universities? Because I feel like we're in a little bit of a desert down here sometimes for university academic uh, help. So, you know, um, the transfer of these technologies is really important for us. And so um, it's a great student project to be able to take an existing technology and then try it in the Jones River, or try it in, in Taunton, or try it in Situ, or wherever. Right? So we're always looking for those applications. And then um, it, it's not random, but it's when there's a student that's interested and, and who has time, and then there's a technology that's ready. Uh, I think that can work. But it shouldn't just be limited to uh, universities. I think USGS has a lot of sensing capability. And I think they would be, I can't speak for them, but they might be open for you know ground truthing or helping out, or adding on a sensor. There's a um, Thompson Island, we, I, I think I call it Stone Soup. We, we started by putting in a, uh, a, a network to get data back to, to a server, and then so and so put in a sensor, and so and so volunteered, you know, donated a sensor, and then someone else did, and then there's people looking at the sensors and ground truth. So there's activity sort of started up. So within your own watershed, if you just put in, you know, USGS has the telemetry, or UMass Boston has the telemetry, people can start adding on and. and once they see that data, they go, oh, can I put, can I, can I, bump, can I donate uh, a sensor to, you know, it could be an expensive sensor, you know, a $10,000 uh, velocity thing and, and Thompson Island going on the dock just as a test so they could sell their instrument through their website. So um, the stone soup idea of just piling on more and more stuff, then you get a really interesting look at, at, at what can be done. And then I would say, it, similar to the messages from the first panel, it's about relationship development, and um, universities uh, need to, I, in my opinion, need to do better at this as well in, in certain fashions. But um, if you have the relationship with the organization, um, they're putting out a lot of grants at a variety of times, depending on who you're working with. And one of the challenges for universities is finding those community partners at the time of writing the grant so that they can make sure that the grant actually aligns with community partner needs. So having those relationships at the outset, so finding a professor that seems to have similar interests or a center at a university that does the kind of research you might be interested in, and just saying, hey, we would love to partner in the future. You may not have the research funds to do this now, but if a student comes along, a grad student, or a grant, you know, we would love to partner on that. And if you set it up at the beginning, it's easier for, for you to get the research that you need, as well as to potentially be um, a collaborator in receiving grant funds, um, if it's from the outset. And then the other technique would be, I think, um, connecting with specific classes on campus that might be able to do the kind of data analysis or um, monitoring that you might want on, on a regular basis. They might be able to incorporate it as a regular class project to get that work done for you. Anyone else in the audience? All right, I'm going to ask another one of my questions. Thanks. Um, this question to really any of you that want to answer this. Um, most of the programs that we do are intended to be part of a project that we're trying to answer. We did the video counting as a result for the data removal project that we did. Or we do our own volunteer account program to look at population trends in children or fish. Um, and so we answer small questions for our small projects. And But that data is um, useful. I think everyone agrees that that data is useful in a larger context. And can you talk to how data sharing can work across all of these monitoring programs? Anyone? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so um, one is just, it's, it's people, right? So person-to-person -person networking and understanding what's happening in different places and you hear that someone knows someone and you connect them and they, you can get that report or that data or whatever. Um, a, a, a more organized way to go about it um, is making your data discoverable, which means that it's online and it has enough metadata 
big words, um, for other people that, and, and machines to be able to find your data. So if you have hearing, make sure the keywords are all over the place and, and, the, and the location and whatnot. And so I might have a machine just going around looking for hearing data and it discovers it automatically. And so this discoverable piece, there are organizations with data standards and all metadata stuff, um, but have enough data associated with your, you know, the common things that make it searchable and then have it online so that, that uh, people or machines can find the data, I think is the most important point. Yeah, and so um, with, the, with the video monitoring systems, you know, what, what an advantage to that is generating uh, media, essentially, pictures and videos, and so with Division of Marine Fisheries, you know, we do quite a bit of good work, but some of it's useless if, if people don't know what we're doing. So we rely a lot on sharing, um, you know, attractive media, good looking videos, things like that, which makes people aware of the work that we're doing and, and might generate some interest in the project. Um, for example, with the Mill River in Taunton, we discovered 10 species at least coming through, one of which was a sea lamprey, which we hadn't seen in that river or knew about in the river, but we did see one on the video system. So, you know, we pressed along and we ended up counting lamprey nests and we got some great GoPro footage of, of spawning sea lamprey. And if people see that video, it might generate some interest in, in not only that river, but other river systems within the watershed. And, um, you know, maybe that, that can lead to, to grant opportunities, more funding, things like that. But um, interest is a big thing. And, and with us, it starts with, with showing people pictures of fish or videos of fish that, that they think are cool. Yeah. Well, I was, I was trying to, I was reflecting on this question and, and maybe possibly working with a regional organization as well. So uh, when I was down at the Cape, the Association for the Protection of Cape Cod, they, they sort of seem to organize a lot of the information and then send that off to DMF. So that was a that was one way I thought, and I think the communities there often get, um, and I don't know if it's DMF who does this or if it's um, APCC, but they get a report of how the other herring runs in the area are doing, so it gives them a sense of how their, their run is in comparison to others. And then I would just say, check with those organizations who you think might be interested in the, your data and try to make sure that you're collecting it in a way that fits. <laughs> Because it, it, you know, sharing it's one thing, but you know, wanting to share it's one thing. Being able to do it in a format that meets the, the systems or the criteria is another. And just real quick, I, I should say that um, any of the data that we collect is available. All you need to do is shoot an email to myself or, or Michael Bednarski, who is the principal biologist for a lot of these video systems. Um, and you know, it's accessible to anybody that needs. And um, I'm sure you know whether it's interesting to you or useful to your to your research, it, it is available. So. There's that. We have maybe two minutes left. If anybody has a question, we can squeeze it in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in relation to the, the dam hole, well, I think I'm going to you want to yeah. give it like a mic. You mentioned. In relation to the dam hole, well, walking road, I know it's warm, and I know where it's What are the parameters? What, are the, what data did you collect in, in, uh, in relation to the progress? So I can speak on behalf of the Mill River in Taunton, which, which is an ongoing project to essentially remove the total four dams that inhibit fish from getting from the ocean to spawning habitat up in, up in the lakes of Taunton, Massachusetts. And so um, the process, our, our intent was to, to generate some pre-restoration idea of what kind of species are coming through, specifically river herring, alewives, and just to make sure that, yes, if we do go through with this work, then there should, we should see a result, which is the colonization of these ponds for, for spawning purposes, and you know eventually the the um, I guess the the revival of the of the herring stocks. So in the Mill River, anyway, we were focusing on generating um, as accurate as possible account of how many river herring were essentially knocking on the door of of the the dam that they can't surpass. Um, and we did we did notice uh, almost a double increase from one year to the next. Um, where nothing changed in terms of dam presence or removal, but it's just somehow whether it's you know this talk of scouting of scout fish, which will poke up up and down a stream, and somehow relate that information to other fish. Um, there's something happening where fish are realizing that they can colonize areas if they're given the chance. So hopefully that answers. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, and we, we also did, um, for, for us it was mostly presence absence, just to verify that fish were passing, not following the dam removal. We also did some, um, some water quality work, but our, our goal there had been fish passage. But I think setting out your goals ahead of time, if, you're, if your dam removal goal is water quality improvement, or downstream flow, or fish passage, or whatever, setting out those parameters, and doing baseline monitoring and then following up with that. You know, is really Did you do any capture studies? We didn't really do it. No, we didn't. Not walking road. We would do that in the next dam down the stream, upstream. Great. I think we're out of time unless we can. We're really out of time. But we, but we do have a 15 minute break again, so certainly feel free to come up and, uh, and bring your question up to any of you. Thanks for your So we'll be starting back up at 10.45, so again, if you can be back in your seats a little bit.